Do you know how much water is used to produce an average pair of jeans? With half of the audience wearing denim, hopefully we can get some guesses. How much? No. No. No, even more. But don't feel bad about not knowing this. Until last summer, I had no idea either. What change? Well, in June, as someone who was new to the field of sustainability, I went to Barcelona to attend the annual meeting of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. SAC is a non-profit organization with over 250 members. They are factories, technology providers, scientists, and of course, brands and retailers, who for the past 10 years have been trying to make the apparel and footwear industries more sustainable. Every year, they get together to report progress, present plans for the upcoming year, and make important decisions together. But they also share case studies from members who are able to make an actual impact thanks to the tools and best practices developed by the organization. On the second day of the event, we were in one of those big windowless conference rooms in the basement of a hotel. After the lunch break, a young man named Deval entered the stage. In a very humble manner, Deval shared the story of his home city, Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad is located in the northeast of India, in the Gujarat state. It might not be that famous, but it's actually the seventh largest city in the country with over six million people. So thanks to Daval, we all learned that in, in this city, the population didn't have drinking water for five days straight last year. Right? Imagine a city, twice as many people as Berlin, no drinking water for, for five days. And I really, I really sat there and I said like, wow, that's, that's really moving me. Like I see this person on stage and he's telling the story that really affects personally him, his relatives, his community. So why am I telling you this? So we started off with this question, right? How much water is used to produce a single pair of jeans? Well, the answer is 7,600 liters. That's roughly 60 bathtubs filled up just for one pair. Right? So hopefully you realize by now that sustainability, and that's the point I'm making, is not only about climate. Of course, I agree with what Henrik said and with what Ulrich said that climate is the single most pressing issue we have right now, but sustainability is much more than climate. And actually water consumption of the textile industry is what contributes to the shortage of water in Ahmedabad. And the story that Duval was sharing was also about how his textile factory, which happens to power a lot of the economy in the area, is trying to reduce the water consumption uh, that they have. But it's not even only about the environment. So environment is one area of sustainability, but the other area is the ethical area of sustainability. So did the farmer growing the cotton used to make the, the pair of jeans get a fair price or was it squeezed for the last penny so he can barely make a living, right? Do the workers in the factory dyeing and stitching those jeans together, do they work in healthy and safe working environment? Like if a fire breaks out, is there even a fire extinguisher? Is there like an emergency exit nearby? Do they know it, right? So that's the ethical, uh, side of sustainability, right? And I'm, I'm telling you this partially to set the context of uh, sustainability, at least for fashion, but also it kind of brings me to the first challenge for product managers that I want to talk about today. And that challenge is understanding your industry. Like hopefully as product managers, you realize that it's very important that you know uh, that you know about the industry that you're uh, operating with. But I want to argue that sustainability creates additional challenges to create that understanding for product managers. Now, why is that? Well, first, the knowledge about sustainability is not that common, right? Apart from a few experts such as Ulrich today 
or few of these certification organizations that Henrik was talking about, there are very, very few people that really understand it all. Even I myself, who have been uh, now on the supply chain of fashion for uh, over three years, I'm still getting lost in those uh, intricate details of what is really better, what is really worse, and how can you really make a, make a good choice. So if it's not common, so how do you, how do you know, how do you learn about that industry, right? I bet in this room, it's much more feasible to find an expert in logistics, an expert in conversion rate optimization, an expert in uh, search engine optimization, but I bet there are very few of us who know about sustainability. And the second challenge is a tool that we often use as product managers, which is competitive benchmarking, is not really helpful. Why? Because it's a new area. If you look at your competitors, chances are none of them, none of them are doing really a lot in, in terms of sustainability, right? So that's kind of the downside of being on the forefront of, of a movement, uh, if you will. But, but there's, there's definitely an upside, and I'll talk about that, that later, right? Now, why is the knowledge of the industry important, right? So we're talking about changing consumer behavior, right? And I'll use an example from my playground, which is fashion, but hopefully it's translatable, right? If we give a choice to the consumer and they have two options, and let's say they differ on trends, so we can say, oh, this uh, pink thing is more stylish than the blue thing, right? Okay, they go for the, for the pink thing, they are more stylish, or they go for the blue thing. Do we really care, right? It's the impact is on a single person that chooses. The worst thing that happens is, oh, they're out of fashion. Oh my God, right? Second example, you can maybe advise someone to buy a more luxurious product. Okay, they spend more money, they pay for a high fashion brand, they feel better about themselves, and the thing that happened is they have less money in their wallet. Okay, their choice, right? But once you start comparing options on environmental impact, I'm sorry if I'm getting in the way, once you start comparing options on environmental impact, then the story changes. And why? Well, first of all, it changes because Environmental impact, unlike those other things, can be scientifically verified, right? Like if there's someone that claims polyester uh, is more environmental friendly than organic cotton, you'll be sure that someone uh, from the science community will raise their hand and say, no, that's, that's not true, right? Second, the impact that it makes is not only for that individual buying uh, this product, the impact is for all of us, right? If we are choosing less environmentally friendly products or less ethical products, the consequences are much greater, right? So this is, this is kind of how it goes. So those choices can be scientifically verified and the choices impact more people, right? And there's one last thing why, why it's also important to know your industry. So a few years ago, some companies have already found out that, oh, the sustainability and eco is becoming a trend. And as uh, proficient marketers, they try to see how can they exploit this trend, right? And exploiting this trend is often seen as, okay, how can we get the most out of it by investing very little, right? And it turned out in a lot of these uh, eco-friendly movements, the doing very little was just basically marketing and PR, right? So by uh, raising the perception of being a more greener company, they basically achieved their return on investment. And the professional term for that is greenwashing, and it means that you're investing more in PR and marketing of your green activities than in the actual change to be, to be greener, right? There's a term for it. And, but what's the consequence? Because those companies were doing that, now there is an erosion of trust in the society. Now a lot of us are much more suspicious when a company is claiming to do something environmentally friendly. We kind of turn on this, this uh, investigative filter and start thinking, 
wait, are they really, really doing what they're saying they're doing or is just like marketing and I'm getting, uh, I'm getting fooled here. So how can you deal with that as product managers? What can you do about it? So number first, kind of obvious, but really works is immerse yourself in the topics, right? And there are plenty of options for that. There are meetups, there are conferences, there are documentaries. So this is so great about this field. It's so, it's so, there are so many passionate people about it that they invest in making documentaries that to teach all of us. There are uh, great TED Talks, there are uh, uh, lessons learned, right? So really, it's, it's kind of really easy to get immersed. Second, find internal allies and experts, right? And you can tell just from tonight, well, Ulrich is a product manager. Henrik is coding now at Minecraft, right? They're not maybe very big uh, environmental activists, but if you find them in your own company, I bet you can find those allies and learn a lot from them because, well, I would love to pick Henrik's brain after he's read all those papers with like 1,500 1, pages instead of reading on my own, right? So it sparks passion. People are passionate about it. You can find those experts. And last, team up with NGOs and, and scientists, right? So this is a way because sustainability is a natural playground for NGOs and, and the organization that are, have the purpose of doing good. It's quite easy to approach them because they see it as a way to maximizing their impact. And for you, it's a way to get that expertise and at the same time, get it from a trustable source. Remember greenwashing, right? Trustable source means there's no doubt what's their intentions because they're not driven by profit. They're driven by purpose. By teaming up with NGOs and schools, you can get that kind of pure intention uh, expertise. Right? So I mentioned, I mentioned greenwashing and I mentioned uh, about companies being clever and exploiting the opportunity. Right? And I, I bet you are kind of outraged because it's morally wrong to, to do that. But at some level, as product managers, you probably kind of understand it. After all, as product managers, we're responsible for the return on investment, right? And getting the most bang out of your buck is what the return on investment is, is all about. And that brings me to the second challenge. And that challenge is understanding your business. Understanding in business in a way that helps you answer the question, what business value do you generate with sustainability? Right? We are all very passionate about ethical reasons. And don't get me wrong, I'm a very uh, big supporter of making ethical decisions in business. But when you encounter a business situation and you have two initiatives competing for an investment and one will optimize your conversion, grow profits or whatever, and the other will make your company more sustainable or make your customers more sustainable, how do you even have that conversation? How do you even compare like apples with a dinosaur or like it doesn't work, right? So I want to I wanna tell you why it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because as product managers and as business leaders, we've been taught to evaluate kind of business values from uh, one of the four perspectives, right? And the, the, that one is hidden, but it's basically either about revenue or cost efficiency and it's either about increasing it or improving it or keeping it at existing level, right? So growing revenue, of course, kind of obvious. Keeping revenue, well, you have a situation on the horizon that is potentially going to cost you your existing revenue, right? Same with cost, of course, I don't know, through automation, uh, automation or through other means, you uh, introduce some cost saving, but there's also a matter of keeping existing costs at bay Let's uh, assume uh, you didn't implement GDPR rules and you're going to get fined, then your uh, cost increases, right? But this is all very prone to focus on the short-term perspective. So what I wanna argue is that there needs to be like a fifth element in this picture. And that element is kind of applied over all of these four. And that is that are strategic investments. And what I mean by strategic investment is there's two things. One is they're long-term in their nature in the sense that the actual impact and benefit of them you will see only in years, 
right? And because of that, it's very hard to prove them and they're often based on beliefs. Well, eventually they will still kind of fall into one of these four buckets, just not now, just not next year, maybe like in, in three years. And that's exactly how we think about sustainability and kind of that helped us a lot. And I'll explain how we think about it using something that hopefully some of you are familiar is, is the Kena model. How many people are familiar with Kena model? Good. So I don't have to explain it in, in a lot of details. Basically, it's a way to uh, make a systematic assessment of which features of your product or which elements of your product fall into kind of basic expectations. So people get extremely frustrated if they are not there, right? But just having them is not creating a big value yet, right? And there are these performance drivers that kind of are the core of your product and you really argue, you really advertise them and, and they're really the core of your offer. And there's also these excitement generators. So if they're not there, so if people don't expect them, but if they are there, they get, they get delighted, right? So to explain it for a hotel example, well, having hot water in the shower in the hotel in most places of the world is kind of basic expectation. So no hotel would even mention this on their website or in booking.com, oh, we have hot water, well, big deal, right? Then you have performance drivers, so it might be like the size of the bed. Oh, it's like one meter 50 uh, and you get a good night's sleep. So, you know, hotels would advertise, people will, uh, will look at that, right? But if you go over here, maybe you get a free welcome drink at the hotel bar, right? Just for, uh, just for checking in. This is something that you weren't expecting. This is probably not why you would choose a hotel but it still generates that, that delight, right? Because it's something extra that you didn't expect. Now, here's a trick about the Kena model. The trick is that this model is not static. So things that you see today and fall into one of these three buckets, they will migrate and they will move and they will start as excitement generators and soon enough, they will migrate to performance drivers and eventually, becoming uh, basic expectations. And there's nothing you can do about it because you're not in control of, of expectations. And that's how we see sustainability. So basically what we're saying is, well, sustainability is maybe an excitement generator today because no one really talks about it. Soon it will become a performance driver. And lastly, it will become basic expectations. So what you're really doing by investing in sustainability is you're making a strategic investment in protecting your future revenue. Because you, if you don't, your customers will go to someone that recognizes sustainability. So there's another question with, value, with valuing, uh, with placing the business value of sustainability in that how do you pr pr prioritize specific initiatives within sustainability? And that's somewhere where I don't really have very specific advice on pure prioritization, just that you have to look at all the things you're used to plus the environmental and ethical impact of, of, uh, of things. But what I want to share is one practical way to see if you're making progress. And because that's important, right? If you're trying something, you have to see if you're going in the right direction or not, right? And that practical advice is having a North Star metric that is about a customer behavior. So what, what me and my team chose as the North Star metric is the percentage of customers who adopt that sustainable behavior. And that's kind of, you can think of it as a self-fulfilling prophecy because, oh, well, we wanna change the behavior and then, oh, we see a change behavior, that means it's, it's happening, but it's also a side that people want that and people want that change, right? And that's a very pragmatic way to, to see if they're uh, going into the right direction. So it's funny that we talk about customers because they happen to be the core, at the core of the next challenge. And that's understanding your customers. So we've understood the industry, we've understood your business and business value, now we're understanding the customers. And I don't need to tell you why understanding customers is important for any business and any product matters. Hopefully, we're past that point right now, right? But I wanna tell you what's tricky about sustainability. And the first thing is this thing called attitude behavior gap. How many people are familiar with that phenomenon? Okay, not that many. So basically what attitude behavior gap means is 
we're saying one thing or we're thinking we'll do one thing and we're actually acting on it, it's different, right? So let me give you a practical example how we tested this for sustainability. We asked customers we knew, so customers for which we had their transaction history, have you already bought something sustainable from Zalando? And from those that answered yes, guess how many actually did that? Not that bad. Around one-fifth. Around one-fifth reported their actual behavior based on history. So it's not even, oh, I was predicting the future, I was wrong, right? Oh, I'll go to the gym next week. Oh, it didn't happen, right? It's just, have you been to the gym last week? And people are saying, yes, I was, well, I didn't see you, right? So that's attitude behavior gap. So if you're trying to understand your customers, that's, that's a known challenge in any area. But what makes sustainability more prone to it? Well, people like to be seen as those that are really good, doing good things, right? So if you ask questions of you test products that go into the direction of doing social good, doing good for others, then you get into the higher risk of people saying they're acting better than they actually are, right? And that's uh, attitude behavior gap. The second challenge in understanding the customer is how it ranks as a decision criteria, right? So you can probably imagine that if you spontaneously have a need for a new product or a new service, well, it has to be sustainable is kind of not top of mind uh, condition for, uh, for most people. Maybe it is for Henrik now, maybe it is for Ulrich, but according to Global Fashion Agenda, only 7% of customers claim that sustainability is the key purchasing criterion when, when buying fashion, right? And, and that wouldn't be even so bad if it wasn't that this criteria kind of shifts places once you go through the customer journey. So maybe you start with that intention, but actually think of the following situation. So maybe if you want to buy a car and you're conscious about the environment, you make a decision as Henrik, are going to buy an electric car, right? And it's a great story, he just told it, right? But actually searching for electric cars, he thought, well, there's not really a one that is good enough or like big enough for my family, so I'll compromise and I'll go for hybrid, right? Perfect example. Same thing happens with, with fashion and other things, right? He's like, oh, I will buy like an environmentally friendly uh, pair of jeans. Well, guess what? Like, imagine you're buying something for your wedding. Right? Would you really flex on like style and like social convention of how you are going to dress up to your own wedding to kind of maybe uh, have like some environmental uh, friendly criteria in mind? Very few people will do that and how they'll change it, of course, depends how high uh, these causes are in their list of values, but also it'll change constantly throughout, uh, throughout their shopping journey. So what's the practical advice to, to dealing with that? Well, first, maybe kind of obvious, is to team up with researchers and designers, and preferably those that have a psychological background, that's those who are experienced in uh, a field called behavioral economics, because those are your allies about understanding the nitty-gritty details of human behavior and decision-making. And the second thing, if you don't have access to, to, to great folks like that, or uh, or if you just simply want to be better prepared to work with them, is up your game on behavioral economics. And there are a couple of resources that I want to share with you that will help you do that. The first is a book called uh, Predictably Irrational, and it's by Dan O'Reilly. He's a psychology and behavioral economics professor at Duke's University, author of many books, and a couple of TED Talks. They're super funny, they're super inspiring. I encourage you to watch them, and I encourage you to read this book, because this book demystifies the myth that we all like to live in, that, oh, we're so rational as human beings. Experiment after experiment, whether it's about weight loss, whether it's about choosing a romantic partner, whether it's about investing, people are making irrational decisions if you, uh, if you construct the right environment, and it's, it's really insightful. 
Second is really short. It's just a 15-minute video, and it's a TED Talk by uh, Irez Yoeli. Uh, he's at MIT, and he's researching, uh, is re he's researching um, um, altruism. So how to get people to be more, more altruistic. And he's worked with uh, power companies that weren't, uh, that weren't, uh, that were encouraging uh, customers to save electricity during peaks. And he's working with many institutions, many very simple, like simple things you can do, very cheap too, to really nudge that customer behavior. So uh, very insightful things. And third is a very recent blog post uh, on Mind the Product. Hopefully you, you, you know that as a resource. Uh, and it's by um, uh, Kristen Berman. And Kristen started, uh, started a design studio together with Dinah Rally. And what they're doing is they're basically piggybacking off that irrationality to help design uh, a better or more influential products. And the last one, is a website called uh, uh, Cogload. It's a conglomerate of cognitive load. And they're a paid service that shares a lot of these different phenomenon that, uh, that we know work in, uh, in psychology. Henrik was just talking about this one phenomenon called foot in the door, right? Like when you make one small step, it's much easier to get people to make bigger steps later on, right? And they're actually are full of uh, insightful things like that. I love this one. It's called the afterlife effect, and it's right up the sustainability alley in fashion. And it says, if people can imagine what their uh, recycled product will become in the future, they're more likely to recycle, right? So imagine right now you're throwing out your plastic bottle into recycle or just disappearing somewhere, right? But imagine you knew what they become you're much more likely to, to really uh, act, up on, uh, act up on that, right? So those are just so some of the resources to up your game on behavioral economics, which gets really important when it comes to sustainability. So let's look, let's look at what we've been talking here about, about today. So I talked about a few challenges, and they're based on my experience in, in fashion, but I bet they are really translatable to, to other industries and uh, other products. Uh, and those were understanding your industry, right? And I talked about it's tricky because it's a really new area, so not that many people know about it. And also you cannot learn from your competition because, well, they're not doing much as most, uh, most of the companies, right? But, and it's really important because, well, if you make, get it wrong, someone will call you out of it and also you can be accused of greenwashing and you definitely don't want that because once you lose that trust of your customer it's very hard to earn this back right second we talked about understanding your business and actually it was about how do you place a business value on sustainability right and we talked about oh these traditional ways of oh more revenue less cost etc they were great in the short term, but you also need to find a way how to justify more long-term investment that are more strategic, right? And we happen to know that uh, sustainability is a strategic investment in the future because we believe that this need will travel from being a delighter to performance uh, generator to basic expectations in the future. So it will become a hygiene factor. So you better get prepared for that. And lastly, it was about understanding your customers, right? And it's tricky because, well, there's social pressure for doing good, right? And um, if there's social pressure, people tend to widen this attitude behavior gap and it's more wide than it's, than it's usual. And it's also hard to figure out how sustainability places in their, in their list of, of criteria, right? So, what I would love for you to take out of this, uh, of this talk is, well, sustainability will become a basic expectation and hygiene factor for the future. And if you don't believe that, there's a statistic that says 64% of consumers will boycott or change brand based on their political or social views that the brand supports. And it's a study from last year. And if you actually deep dive deeper into different cohorts of respondents, you'll see that the current generations are more likely to do that than the older generation. So Gen Z is much more likely to switch brand because of political and social issues than millennials, than uh, X and baby boomers. So 
it's a trend and it's, and it's there, right? And if you're still not convinced, I want to tell you from my personal experience that it's simply very rewarding to do something that helps with sustainability, right? So imagine what Henrik said, like, hey, how do I, how do I make the most impact? Okay, I've reduced all my current footprint, right? Now, how do I get all the people uh, to do it, right? And we all do that as product managers. We build scalable products that reach sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands, sometimes millions of people, right? So if you as product managers can change the behavior of that many people, that's a pretty, uh, pretty powerful thing, right? So I really encourage you, please start preparing for that future today. If you're an individual contributor, uh, hopefully you have a head start by uh, hearing my, my advice today. If you're a leader, I encourage you to create an environment where teams can explore that and create mechanisms where certain more strategic investments uh, that are more have long-term effect get also prioritized in, in the way to do business. So really start preparing for that future today. Thank you.